Thanks very much, Nick, for that great uh, introduction to the whole day and for organizing a really informative, not to say highly industrious week for Pamela and me. <laughs> um, but it was great to have the opportunity particularly to visit schools and see what's going on on the ground um, in, in South Africa. Um, and very reassuring, or I guess encouraging in a sense, to be able to see schools where uh, instruction was going on in the children's native language. That is not an experience we very often have a chance to see with such richness and consistency in the US where second language speakers are uh, scattered much more and where local policies often don't support native language uh, use in the schools. Um, so I'm going, but I am, I'm going to talk about reading in a second language, what might get transferred, and I'm talking about L1 and L2, uh, thinking of L1 as the home language, of course, and L2 as whatever it is, a second language, a foreign language, an additional language, uh, interpret it in your own, uh, in your own context. So, and I, I made the strategic decision, given that I only have 25 minutes or so, although we're a little early next time, I might take 27, um, <laughs> uh, not to give you all the, uh, all the data and all the citations, but sort of make some bold statements based on my reading of the research literature. I, I'll give you my email address, and if you don't believe some of what I'm claiming, you can, you can write me and I'll send you the backup, okay? So um, this is a kind of a, a high level uh, summaries of, of research. So first of all, uh, about age and L2 learning, right? uh, which is a, an issue because whenever there is a, a challenge of kids learning in a first language, and, but then they're going to have to learn another language in order to succeed in the society, um, how long do we spend in the first language and how, how late can we make the transition or how early should we make the transition, right? Um, and so I, just the research literature is very clear on these um, four statements, uh, that second languages can be acquired to a high level at any age. <coughs> There is not a critical period after which the language acquisition uh, capacity dries up or implodes. Uh, so you can start it. You can start it at three, or you can start at seven, or you can start at eighteen and get to a very high level in a second language. Right? So that should not be a consideration in thinking about uh, appropriate timing. Um, Older learners, uh, at least up to the age of 25, I don't, after that probably there's another, there's a sort of a decline, but at least up to the age of 25, older learners are typically faster and more efficient at acquiring second languages than younger learners. And you can imagine there are lots of reasons why that might be. They're smarter, <laughs> they're more strategic, they're uh, more, uh, more able to use metacognitive capacities. Um, typically, they are, have literacy skills. They can apply to the second language. Um, but whatever the reason, uh, the sort of timing of, first, of de devotion to second language learning, we've shown in multiple studies with immersion and bilingual programs in the States, you can start a second language immersion at age, uh, at age 12 and you get about as far in a year as if you start at age six uh, in three years. Um, early L2 learners can be at risk of losing L1 in some social contexts. Uh, and we know that's, of course, very much a risk in a situation where the L1 is not uh, of value or is not socially valued or, uh, or instrumental. Uh, but it's, it's also a somewhat moderated statement because what do we mean by losing L1? Does losing L1 mean, well, you can't talk to your grandmother anymore? Some, in some cases, it's that bad that you can't talk to your grandmother anymore. But in a lot of cases, it's a little, it's a little less severe. It's like, well, yeah, I can talk to my grandmother, but not about what I'm studying at school. 
uh, or not about politics or not about what's going on in my love life, right? Um, which is where your grandmother might be particularly useful. Um, and the reason for those uh, moderated attrition uh, situations, I would say, is that full control over any language actually requires having fairly decent literacy skills in that language. There are aspects of language acquisition which are dependent on sophisticated literacy. You encounter the words, you encounter the complex syntax, you encounter the, the multiple uh, perspectives only uh, after the third grade reading that uh, would get you through the leopard story. Um, things we know about bilingual learners. I, I hope you're writing down things you disagree with here because I'm here all day. You can, you can come and argue with me. Um, the, prof the proficiency profile of young simultaneous bilingual learners, kids who grow up in a household or a, a local setting where two languages are available, pretty much reflects the input profile. Right? If you're hearing in Miami, uh, Florida, Spanish 80% of the time and English 20% of the time, you will be a lot more proficient in Spanish than in English. But you will know a little English. However, you would not be considered proficient in English typically under those settings unless, unless there's somewhere between 40 to 60% uh, exposure to each language. In other words, there is a time on task element in language learning. Um, bilingual education, has, having two languages in the classroom can work and often does and often doesn't. <laughs> and so the big issue is not should we have a bilingual education policy, but what, what has to be tweaked in that policy to make it effective. In the US, we've had lots of natural and uh, sometimes modestly rigorous comparisons of early transition from home language to second language uh, to English, late transition from home language to English, um, never transition from home language to English. Um, and what we find in general is that all of those kinds of bilingual programs protect proficiency in the first language without threatening proficiency in the second language. In other words, the big difference between kids who go through bilingual programs and monolingual programs who come from non-English homes is not their English proficiency. The big difference is their home language proficiency. Um, and then there is a very effective bilingual program model, uh, one that has generated most of the positive uh, research findings about bilingual education. It's one that's almost never implemented for reasons which are beyond my ken. Uh, but the most effective model is actually, for, the, for kids in the US, where transition to English pretty quickly is pretty important, um, the most effective model is two teachers who can be monolingual teachers uh, in principle, one of whom teaches this curriculum in the home language today, and then one who teaches that same curriculum in the second language tomorrow, in effect. Right? So in other words, very good language models and very well-planned and coordinated curricular uh, resources. The reasons that don't, doesn't happen, of course, include you have to, you know, people have to have planning time. You have to have the well-aligned curricula. Uh, you can get away with hiring one teacher and instead you have to hire two teachers. You can see why principals wouldn't want to do that. Um, something else we know about bilingual learners, um, as, as I said, but learners in late transition bilingual programs perform as well in English as those in early transition programs. Older arrivals to English schooling, so immigrants at age 12 rather than age 6 or kids born in the U.S. who speak uh, another language at home until they get to school, they transition to full English proficiency more rapidly than young arrivals. And if they're literate that in L1, that's another huge boost to uh, successful transition. And again, the most effective bilingual program model this coordination between L1 and L2 is rarely implemented. So, okay, that, those are my 
uh, summary statements that I c could uh, document for you if you wanted, uh, and I had access to the internet. Um, but there are some important caveats. Uh, the, so I just, again, I'm talking about, I am talking about L2. Most of this research has been done in the US, so we're talking about L2. We're talking about going from a small minority language to a large and globally very powerful uh, second language, right? Um, and highly valued second language, and a second language which has certain linguistic characteristics, of course. Um, English is a pretty good target for second language learning because there are so many varieties and because there are, um, there's a lot of tolerance for different versions. Um, so that's one uh, caveat, that the local sociolinguistic setting is very important in predicting uh, any, any, any outcome from any intervention of this type. And secondly, that the, yes, on average, bilingual programs work better than monolingual programs for second language learners, but the quality of the program will always explain more variance than the type of program. A good monolingual program will generate better outcomes than a bad bilingual program. We used to be able to use the word Trump to explain that. <laughs> um, so the, the, these claims about bilingual learners, that late transition bilingual programs perform as kids, those kids perform as well, or that older arrivals or that literate arrivals um, typically fare better in second language learning. And, and of course the question is why? How do we explain that? What, how do we understand that, those, uh, those very robust observations? So um, you might think for a moment about why you think that is. You might turn to your partner and spend one minute uh, hypothesizing why these late learners and literate learners have more uh, have more potential. All right. One minute. Go. <laughs> One minute is up. <laughs> now that's the trouble. This is why teachers don't like to use discussion in the classroom. <laughs> okay. Um, but I got, we got some great photographs out of that too. So uh, give me one over there, third row in the middle. Give me one hypothesis. One hypothesis, somebody in the middle third row there. What's a re one reason why older and more literate learners might do better in second language learning? Because oh. what? They're more mature. They're more mature, okay. Good, good hypothesis, one from over here. Yeah, go see. Well, you said because uh, you transfer the skills that you have in your first language into learning second language, so you use your first language as a base to learn the second language. So you have resources from L1 that you can use in L2. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so you're older and smarter and you have more resources. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think those are exactly the, the two, two right answers. And in particular, these language resources, um, you know, fall out in different domains. Uh, but it's interesting that a lot of work on second language acquisition looks at these resources and talks about negative transfer, right? Oh my God, <laughs> it's so hard to learn that language because it's so different from this language. Um, so the, the, the challenge is to probe to the level where, the diff where we emphasize the similarities, the resources rather than the differences. And of course there are differences, uh, you know, I like, Phonology, well, yeah, it's, it's um, 
helpful, but it's not all helpful, and some of it is uh, our phonological resources to generate a, an accent in L2. Now, a lot of us don't really care about accents in L2. Some of us revel in our accents in L2, but um, teachers sometimes worry about them. Um, grammar, again, yeah, there's gram there are grammatical similarities. There are certain grammatical categories that are present in every language. And if you know something about the grammar of your first language, then it's easier to have, get and understand an explanation of the grammar of your second language. Um, but of course there are grammatical uh, defaults that are, can be hard to correct. Metalinguistic awareness, now I think this is a total win, like, oh gee, I understand the structure of language. And this language has a structure which is somewhat different, but uh, the structure is there. Discourse skills, well, yeah, that they exist uh, and that there are some overlaps in discourse skills. And if the second language community is willing to abide by, to acknowledge the same conversational skills or the same narrative skills, then that's even a greater win, right? So you don't have to learn a whole new set of discourse skills. Vocabulary is the place where this gets talked about a lot. Um, people say uh, in the US where most of our second language English learners are Spanish speakers, oh well yeah, that's easy. There's so much, there's so many cognates, there are so many words in Spanish that uh, give kids a leg up in English. And that is true uh, for form sometimes be between closely related languages. Um, but I would argue that it's true for all pairs of languages if you focus on meaning. Right? That if you know the meaning of a word in L1, what you're learning in L2 is just a new label. Mm -hmm. And the more you know about that word in L1 and the, the richer conceptual structures you have around that word in L1, the easier putting a new label on it is and the more powerful putting a new label on it is. So I'm going to show, because this is, I think, probably an obligatory slide for any American uh, researcher in this field um, to show. And I'm sure you've seen it. These are the very elderly data now from Hart and Risley showing social class differences in um, vocabulary acquisition. These have been um, much uh, criticized um, for, on various grounds, on methodological grounds, um, in particular, um, but uh, if you sort of take them at face value, I'm really interested in them more for uh, their consequences in the educational discourse than, um, than wanting to argue about whether they exactly represent differences across um, children or families. Uh, but basically, high SES kids enter kindergarten if you, uh, if you continue sort of take these uh, growth curves seriously, uh, knowing about 5,000 words of English and kids in the least privileged families represented here enter kindergarten knowing about 1,500 vocabulary items in English. And that's a pretty big difference uh, in <coughs> resources available for acquiring literacy because knowing a lot of words is very tightly predictive of phonological awareness. It's predictive of being able to acquire the, just the decoding skills of English. And of course, it's highly related to um, comprehension uh, later on. Um, these are the data that have in the US uh, generated a, a lot of attention, the so-called 30 million word gap, which is not 30 million words uh, of kids' knowledge, of course. It's not that some kids know uh, 1 million words and other kids know uh, 29 million. It's how many words they've heard. And uh, the uh, presumption is the analysis suggests that the kids on the, the, uh, with the rapid vocabulary acquisition also hear many more words from their parents much more intensively, that they get talked with a lot more. So that's. Uh, generated I, what I think is a rather depressing uh, set of policy initiatives in the states. Um, let me show you similar data for bilingual kids. Uh, these are Spanish home language children uh, who are uh, four years old entering 
uh, early childhood programs like Head Start, I'm being tested in both Spanish and English. Right? So this, every dot is a kid. This is their score on Spanish vocabulary. This is their score on English vocabulary. And this is the population mean that you would expect for monolingual Spanish or English speakers, or highly proficient Spanish and English speakers. So highly proficient kids um, would, would be around there. You'll see there is one highly proficient child, highly proficient bilingual, <laughs> in this sample of 120 kids. Um, but a lot more are falling below uh, what would be considered uh, even a low uh, ex acceptable level for both Spanish and English. Right? Uh, and, and that is, of course, not disastrous. They're still going to learn some words, and they do over the course of the next year. The whole uh, cloud shifts up and left, learning English, losing Spanish, and that's really too bad, be partly because that means those transfers that are, would be possible from home language to second language are just being forfeited. Right? All of the stuff that kids could be learning and knowing in Spanish is now not going to be learned and known be and be available for transfer to English. So the 30 million word gap in the US has really led to a lot of you know, talk to, it's a lot of public uh, messaging, talk to your kids more, uh, word walls in preschools, um, all kinds of stuff. And I think it's really a kind of a mistake uh, to talk about it very much because we talk about it as if it's a list of words and it's not a list of words, it's a lot of knowledge. And it's the knowledge that is transferable. Not necessarily the words, but the knowledge. Uh, if we think about literacy rather than um, uh, language, of course, literate, those literate older learners also have a lot of literacy resources from L1, potentially. Um, and, you know, letter recognition, the notion of phoneme graphene mapping, if it's, if they're two alphabetic languages. Uh, perhaps most importantly, the awareness that reading is about meaning, the experience, the personal experience that you can get meaning off the page. This is not an experience that all kids have had by grade two or grade three, right? A lot of them have the experience that you can get words off the page, you can get sounds off the page, not that you can construct meaning. But if that has happened, if you've had that experience in your first language, then of course um, that is what, how you approach reading in a second language. Um, so lots of resources that are potentially helpful, I think. But the question is, are they automatically helpful? And here is where the, the tongue challenge becomes a teaching challenge, right? Because they're not. And even Spanish-speaking kids learning English, transfer does not seem to be automatic. Now, when I learned Spanish as an, as a, as an adult well past the critical period, I could use uh, transfer. Uh, I could use cognates pretty richly. I could say things like, oh, amenaza. That's related to menace, isn't it? And my native Spanish speaking, very good bilingual colleague would say, oh, gee, I didn't know that. Yeah, I guess it is, okay? So I had transfer skills because of uh, a lot of metalinguistic awareness that fourth graders do not have. Fourth graders do not look at um, amigo and think amiability. Right? They do not, and they don't even see very close cognates unless they can read well because they don't sound as similar as they look on the page. Right? So we have to teach them to do that. What do we do though to combat the vocabulary gap between bilinguals and monolinguals? We tell parents just talk more and we do these word walls and we kind of do lots of uh, of unembedded vocabulary teaching. And what do we do about the worries that they're not reading well enough? Well, in the US, what we do is we start L2 reading earlier and earlier and spend more and more time on it, which means it gets divorced from meaning more effectively. Um, and it's the time on task principle, which does, which is not irrelevant, but the time on task principle <laughs> 
is not necessarily a simple predictor of what's going to work well, particularly if you can exploit L1, L1 skills. So I'm going to propose two not totally well worked out, but mergeable alternatives that I think we need to, we need to think about, which is uh, we need to help teachers think about knowledge-infused curricula rather than just language-focused curricula, and, and conscious efforts to build L2 skills on L1 knowledge. So I'm going to give you two little quick studies. There's one of these was done by a former doctoral student of mine who was working in Arizona, Spanish-speaking kids, bilingual staff in Head Start programs serving very under-resourced kids. And he convinced the teachers to do an experiment. Half the teachers read um, two books about caterpillars and butterflies in, um, in English. The goal was to see if kids could learn words like caterpillar and butterfly and metamorphosis. He, and so one set of classrooms got English book, another English book, and the next week those two English books and discussion in English about those books. And the other classroom got a, a book in, the book in Spanish and then the same book in English. So half the time, half the time in English, but uh, Spanish support. And what you see here is that um, support from L1, the, the Spanish then English group, um, learned the taught vocabulary much better. That's the blue line. Um, and uh, actually in a general vocabulary test learned faster. The um, Spanish assessments with these kids suggest that withholding support from L1 basically taught these kids, don't bother with Spanish. Their Spanish grew more slowly, both in learning the targeted words and in a general vocabulary assessment. So that's, um, the message was evidently, we're really worried about English here, don't, don't spend your time on Spanish. But their Spanish and their English were more effectively promoted by the Spanish then English model. One other um, program I've been involved in, this is uh, led by Vivica Gröver and Veslame Rutland at the University of Oslo, and they are looking at Oslo kindergartens um, where half, at least half the kids are second language speakers of Norwegian. And they introduced an intervention um, that involved uh, thematic uh, four themes, picture books, telling the teachers to read with the kids, which they don't do in Norwegian kindergartens very much. Um, and uh, books like this promoting uh, focus on emotion and, and the environment. And they tested the kids in lots of different ways, but one key element of the program was they sent uh, one book from each theme home every week for the parents to read with their kids. Wordless versions of those books for the parents to read in their home language with the kids. So the kids, once in a while, would sit down to read with the teacher and it would be a book they'd already heard in the home language. And this program, uh, this paper is just about, it's just been accepted by child development. Um, no effects on the L1 skills, actually, that were worth reporting, uh, but Vocabulary that was taught, uh, grammar in Norwegian, uh, narrative skills in Norwegian, and perspective taking skills in Norwegian, all uh, significantly better in the kids who had this home language than Norwegian experience. So um, I think those are just a couple of uh, cases of sort of rigorous findings in experimental studies of successful L1 support to L2. If people are interested later, I can talk to you about the work my colleague Shen Chense has done in, um, in Xinjiang. It's now ended for reasons you might have read about in the newspaper. I think you could talk to Elbi about Funda Ujabule and what's going on in Soweto with this model, that a major predictor of school success is world knowledge, talking to kids about things that matter in L1 so as to uh, focus on the content and let the transfer happen in the natural way that it will if a domain of knowledge is really accomplished, words associated with that knowledge domain uh, will get um, easily transferred 
to the next language. Thank you. Yeah. It's been like more than 20 years of this work and people have really been listening to the work that we at PISA have done to show the importance of the mother tongue um, and as well as bilingualism in the classroom or multilingualism. I'm just concerned about two things mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of the presentation, especially um, um, how people might interpret the use of the first language as, as a means to get to English. Um, because we are wanting to develop uh, the first languages or the home languages for their own sake, mm -hmm. not as a means for helping with the transition. And um, we know that in this country, um, even though we have a policy of bilingualism or additive multilingualism, um, we, we kind of we think that the, the use of the mother tongue in the foundation phase is actually the means to get the children to transition to English because then nothing else is happening uh, mm -hmm. you know is happening from grade four onwards with the mother tongue. Yeah. And the second question for me is is around the vocabulary and the and the and the and the, and the social economic status of the children. It does feel like it's a bit of, of a deficit view of the children coming from poor backgrounds. Uh, so my, my question is uh, how do we account for the children who, are, who have rich language resources that they bring from home? Especially, um, like, we, we know that the language that is used for ceremonies, the language that is used in church, the language that is used for praise singing, the language that is used in songs, is so rich that the children are, are, are exposed <coughs> to that language. So how come that when they come to school, we seem to think that they do not have rich language when they come to school. And remember, if children are being told stories at home, also the language of the stories is different from the language of everyday use in the class, I mean, okay. uh, when people talk. So my question is uh, around brain plasticity. I was always under the impression, and I'm sure there's been research about this, that said that the younger children are the more their brains are like sponges, which is where the whole notion about the younger you expose your children to many languages better their chances are of being multilingual or bilingual. Mm -hmm. But you, what you, the, you know, what you, what you said about bilingual is it seems to go against that. And you are yeah. suggesting that the later a child is exposed to a second language, the better for the child also. I mean, so I just want to... Uh, uh, okay. All right. Well, let me say that I think I do acknowledge that language acquisition occurs uh, in the brain. <laughs> there is a brain and it, uh, it changes when we learn a language. Uh, but when you say a young child's brain is like a sponge, I think that's exactly right. It's sponge-like. It is, does not have a lot of internal structure. And the absence of internal structure, the absence of well-traced uh, pathways or the uh, uh, embryonic versions of those well-traced pathways, is uh, what makes it so easy to lose your first language when you're learning a second language as a young child, right? That's, that's very, not an infrequent occurrence. Um, but, and of course it isn't, I'm not arguing that you can't tell the difference between an early language learner and a second language learner, and a late second language learner. The late learner is more likely to have an accent. The late learner is more likely to have little minor traces of the first language. But they don't, they're not necessarily less proficient and they are faster at it. And if we're worried about time in educational settings, and I think worrying about how much time we need to, this is Sarah's question, you know, how much time does it take? And first of all, it takes time. I think there's lots of evidence that there does need to be some minimal commitment of time. And secondly, there need to be authentic opportunities for use. You do not learn a language, most people, most of us don't learn languages from studying them in textbooks or from um, having well-structured lessons from uh, non-native speakers, right? You learn a language when you've really got to use it. And that is, of course, a great advantage for second language learners as opposed to additional language learners. Uh, and I would think, I mean, I, this is, but this is a hypothesis and somebody out there might have, give, find the resources to test it that additional language learning would be much more efficient if it were done 
if it were started later and more intensively rather than being started earlier and less intensively. I think that's the kind of experiment we would, we would really want to see the results of in the South African context. Carly, I, um, I, nothing I have presented here suggests um, that I believe that kids who speak one language at home are necessarily impoverished because they speak that language. I think the question is, how does what they speak at home get used as a resource for learning other languages, not because you want to lose the language from home, not because you don't want to continue to develop the language at home, but because learning the other language and, ha and, and accomplishing the academic tasks that are going to be required in that other language can be more efficiently done and easier if we figure out how to do this transfer from L1 to L2. And so that's, that's really my concern. It's, yes, I, I think it's also very concerning that immigrant children in the US often do have what we are no longer allowed to call deficits in their home language, but that's partly because their parents are not valuing the home language, right? They're sort of like, oh, my kid's gonna go to school in English. I don't need to talk to him very much or in Spanish or read books in Spanish anymore. And that's a terrible, terrible situation. Um, I'm just gonna show, whoops, show you my, um, uh, whoops, my, email so that if people have questions um, and you don't catch me this afternoon, you can send me an email. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks.